guests. Thank you, Dermot, and good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here in London, sunny London, compared to a snowy Dublin, I have to say. Um, I'm going to talk about effective legal tools in a procurement crisis, and I'm coming at this from a legal practitioner's perspective, um, a legal practitioner who uh, constantly deals uh, with queries from clients who say that they have a crisis and that they need to do something really urgently and that there's no way that they can comply with the procedures in the EU procurement rules because it is a straight jacket and they can't achieve what they need to achieve. Um, and that's where I want to start really, is this perception um, about the procurement rules, I think, which we all can see um, throughout uh, contracting authorities. And the perception is that the procurement rules um, are not well equipped uh, to deal uh, with um, situations where there might be some type of crisis. So um, you get the feedback from clients that they see this, um, the procedures are too long, lengthy, it takes them maybe you know three or four weeks to get, to get together their procurement documents, <coughs> and it can take them three or four weeks to get through a pre qualification <coughs> stage, um, then a couple of weeks in terms of evaluation, and making sure they get the evaluation right, then going out with the tender another month or so, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, maybe even a month for evaluation, and then finally the end of the procedure, the standstill period, dealing with unsuccessful bidders, lengthy process, no way we can do um, our procedure for an urgent uh, requirement in that timeline. Um, but um, if you are a procurement body who knows about procurement rules, you probably know that that uh, perception um, is probably ill-founded because procurement rules in fact do contain a number of um, useful tools that can be applied um, in any situation really um, to deal uh, with urgent requirements and that is what I'm going to focus on now. So starting with, um, I guess, the starting with the areas which are probably more compliant versus going down the line to areas where you're running into perhaps uh, compliance issues. Um, it goes back to a lot of the themes that we've heard today, all about good planning. Professor Piga said it, um, uh, the Chris's this morning um, said it, thinking ahead, thinking about what might happen um, in the, uh, during your, your, when you're procuring, um, looking into the future will assist you in terms of preparing for um, an incident and it may not turn into um, a, a crisis. So for example, framework agreements. Framework agreements, uh, we've seen a, a greater use of framework agreements uh, really since the, the, they became law and uh, part of the 2004 directives. We've got different types of framework agreements. We've got single supplier agreements, we've got uh, multi supplier framework agreements. Um, we can, um, single supplier probably easier um, in a situation where you have an urgent requirement to just do a straight call up under your single supplier. But you can have a framework agreement with multi suppliers where you have different mechanisms for call ups. So you can have um, dual methods. You can say, um, we're going to, for example, do a rotation or a cascade in certain situations, or we're going to run a mini competition and you could have a situation in your in your framework agreement where you say where well, we need an urgent requirement uh, we will uh, perhaps uh, go to the most economic, economically advantage, advantageous tender um, on the framework agreement so that the, the entity that ranks number one in the initial competition will get uh, the call up for the for the urgent requirement dynamic purchasing systems uh, much more now user friendly in the 2014 directives unlike the 2004 directives where nobody really ever used dynamic purchasing systems because there was a requirement to go back out to publish a second notice. Um, and uh, there was also indicative tenders required at the outset of the process. Now with dynamic purchasing systems, you can set these systems up. There's no limit in terms of the, uh, the, the duration, unlike framework agreements where you have um, a four year uh, max, no maximum term for uh, a DPS. Um, you, they're essentially, a dynamic purchasing system really is a, is a fancy name for a, a panel of pre-qualified suppliers, almost like the qualification systems that we've seen in the utility sector. You can have these panels of pre-qualified suppliers that you call on when you have um, a, an urgent requirement. You don't have to go through your pre-qualification phase because you've been doing it um, uh, as, as you've set up the dynamic purchasing system and it's an open system, so you're doing this pre-qual as you go along. So a, a panel of pre-qualified bidders that you can have for lots of different types um, of requirements. I've seen that DPS is used, for example, repair and maintenance, um, very effective uh, there. You can see it, for example, in health sector uh, for um, a, you know, commonly used purchases like food, um, for, uh, you know, commodities, 
um, right across uh, the range. And we're beginning to see a lot more uh, use of dynamic purchasing systems in Ireland. And I'd say um, it's probably a trend that's going to be replicated across Europe. Variation clauses. Um, again, in the new 2014 directives, Professor Piga talked about the fact that there is uh, more discretion in the 2014 directives, and we definitely see around the whole area of uh, changes, modifications, and um, that contracting authorities have been given greater discretion. Provided you draft your variation clause in your contract in line with the conditions under the directive, um, then you can use these variation clauses when you have um, a requirement for uh, an urgent purchase, uh, purchase. It needs to be clear, it needs to be precise, it needs to be unequivocal. You need to specify the scope and nature um, of the type um, of requirement that you uh, may, uh, may need under this variation clause. But that's not to say that you can't do it. And you know, most well drafted contracts will have a very effective variation clause that will allow you to, um, to, to procure urgency if you need to. Accelerated procedures. Under the 2014 directive, we have now the fastest procurement procedure that you can that we've ever had, the 15-day open accelerated procedure. Um, so again, a, a contracting authority will come on and say, I, I, I just can't do it, I can't comply with the time. And we say, well, you can't comply with a 15-day open accelerated procedure um, under the, these directives. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult uh, to say to a court, ultimately, that there's no way that you can comply with that open accelerated procedure timeline. So you've got a tool there um, for accelerating. Under the, the crisis line, the, the areas which are probably more difficult to justify, the procedures more difficult to justify, I'm going to start um, with the uh, two on the right. The first, the additional purchases under the existing contract. So this is where contracting authority um, is uh, intending to procure additional work supplies or services because they say that there are technical um, or economic reasons and that uh, they would, there would be substantial duplication of their force and significant inconvenience if they have to go to someone else. Um, it's, I've got it down under the, in terms of the more red zone because there's a number of conditions there you have to comply with in order to be able uh, to, uh, to, to, to effect a change on, uh, on this basis. Um, and you, uh, some of the other conditions you have to, if it's in the public sector, the value of the change can't be more than 50% um, of, the, of the contract value. And you have to go out to the official journal and publish um, a notice in relation to the modification that you're making. So more difficult to justify, but we'll see in a second that there has been use, um, quite a lot of use um, of this change mechanism um, in, in the last year. Another uh, situation where you can make changes um, under the new 2014 directive, changes to existing, uh, um, uh, to existing contracts before because of unforeseen circumstances. Now those circumstances can't be circumstances that the contracting authority itself didn't just uh, foresee. It has to be circumstances that a diligent contracting authority uh, wouldn't have foreseen. Uh, but if you can make that uh, case, and again, it's below 50%, and again, you publish uh, a notice um, in the OJ in relation uh, to the uh, to the change, then you can rely um, on on this uh, on, on this basis for for making the change. On the left hand side, we have um, the. The, probably the, the procedure that most uh, contracting authorities think about uh, when they have um, a crisis and they need to make um, an urgent procurement. And that is the use of the negotiated procedure without a prior call for competition because of um, extreme urgency. Um, and uh, there are a number of conditions around uh, that extreme urgency ground. And it probably goes to uh, Chris, Chris's description this morning about um, different types of, um, uh, of crises here we're really talking about, um, I think it was the uh, critical incident, the, the one at the very bottom. These are critical incidents, uh, which uh, what the procurement rules really only deal with. Has to be extreme urgency caused by uh, unforeseeable events, which were not, uh, which are not attributable to the contracting authority, um, and it is difficult to justify um, that exception. And, and I'll look at the case law in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the courts have been very reluctant uh, to find that contracting authorities have been justified in relying um, on this ground. Contracting authorities have in many cases tried to rely on it, um, but in most cases uh, the courts um, have not been accepting of the fact that these circumstances uh, were, were justified. Um, but again, uh, I would say that a lot of contracting authorities would say that they are meeting these circumstances and we will see evidence in a few minutes that um, there are quite a lot of direct rewards. And these are um, some examples from the case law in relation to circumstances where 
um, this uh, negotiated procedure without a prior proposal competition has been relied on. Um, a UK case, uh, I'm sure a lot of you will heard, have heard about it, nationwide gritting services versus Scottish ministers. This related to um, very bad winters um, up in Scotland in 2009, 2010, and then uh, on to the next in 2011-2012, where um, the, basically uh, Scotland was running out of the ice and so and there was a serious um, a, a danger uh, that, uh, that, that there could be uh, could, could be serious road traffic accidents because of the lack of uh, the ice and so um, So the Scottish uh, government took it on itself um, to go and to procure, um, without a competitive tendering, tendering procedure, uh, quite an amount of salt um, over two bad winters uh, without running a procurement process. Um, ultimately, a company brought the case before the Scottish courts, arguing that there had been a breach of procurement rules. Um, the, the Scottish government retrospectively tried to rely on the extreme urgency ground, saying that, well, these were very severe winters. Uh, we couldn't have uh, forecast uh, the, the, the extreme weather conditions, and therefore we were justified um, in using um, the negotiated procedure without a prior vote for competition. Interestingly, uh, the Scottish courts held that the, uh, that the Scottish government was justified in relation to at least the first winter, in that um, the weather conditions were so severe um, that, th that they could justify um, that these were um, the, the conditions for use of this procedure were met. But not so in relation to the second winter because they should have foreseen um, this uh, th th this crisis. Um, the the courts did rely on the Commission versus Italy case, um, uh, Advocate General's uh, judgment in that uh, opinion in that case. But Advocate General uh, Jacob, sorry, had had said that um, it would be possible to justify um, a case of extreme urgency in relation to particular extreme weather conditions. Uh, which couldn't have been foreseen. Ultimately, that case uh, was held not to be um, admissible in the court's indulgence of court's judgment on it, but the Advocate General's uh, opinion is quite interesting. Um, another two Italian cases, and I, and I apologize to professors all seem to be right Italy, but um, where the court held uh, that Italy wasn't justified um, in relying on the extreme urgency ground, one in relation to uh, flood basins, uh, where the court said, well, the, the Italian contracting authorities have known about these work for quite some time. They were drawing down the funding in, in various lots, but they couldn't rely on the extreme emergency grant. And uh, additionally, in relation to uh, the, the construction of, a, of an avalanche barrier, and um, where again, the contracting authorities have known um, about uh, the risk of avalanches uh, quite some time in advance of actually commencing the work. So therefore, they could have actually um, carried out a, um, a proper procurement process um, within the timeline. So the, just in summary, in relation to the case law, I would say that the courts take a very restrictive approach to the circumstances for not relying on the negotiated procedure. The burden is on the public body to show um, that uh, they can rely on these circumstances. Um, and um, it's very, very difficult uh, to demonstrate to the courts um, that the, the conditions are met. Notwithstanding that, um, I do think it is quite interesting um, that there are quite a number um, of uh, direct awards uh, throughout the European Union. And this is just um, a very uh, you know, a quick um, overview um, of uh, the, the notices published in the official journal um, where contracting authorities have either published a voluntary ex ante transparency notice, uh, the voluntary ex ante transparency notices, or in the way of deep notices, or notices that you would publish. Um, where you're trying to um, uh, prevent a court perhaps from awarding an effectiveness remedy. So you, you publish this notice so that if you were ever sued in the courts, you can say, well, we published a beat, um, so uh, the, 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 the court sh uh, shouldn't grant uh, in an effectiveness remedy. Also, you can get the time running in terms of the, of the review period. So you publish these beats basically uh, to, to give yourself some protection when you're doing a direct award. And as you can see from this slide, um, there's been approximately 50,000 uh, beat notices published um, uh, over the last five years. Um, as uh, beat notices and modification notices, the modification notices came in with the 2014 directives, so are only valid for the last year. They relate to the two conditions I talked about in relation to contract changes uh, for unforeseeable uh, events and um, where additional requirements um, are made under the contract. Um, but Quite a number, and I would say these are probably the tip of the iceberg because these are only situations where the contracting authority has actually gone out and published um, a notice, uh, perhaps to protect itself legally 
uh, if there were if it was to be a legal challenge. Um, and as I said, it probably goes back to the initial perception that the procurement rules um, are not perceived uh, to uh, be suitable um, where the contracting authorities believe that they are in a crisis situation or they have a, a real urgent requirement uh, for some work to the services and they therefore can't rely on any of the uh, normal procedures uh, within uh, the rules. The only thing I would say though is that we can see that in the last year there has been a bit of a drop off in terms of the number of these notices being published and that might be um, evidence that the 2014 directives are working to some extent in terms of they have given a few more tools in terms of dynamic purchasing systems, uh, accelerated open uh, procedures, uh, variation clauses and so on and perhaps there might be a trend towards uh, a lesser number of direct awards but probably too early to be seen. Who publishes uh, these direct award notices? Um, France has always been the front runner I have to say ever since I've, I've been looking at these, these notices um, since they came in with the uh, uh, with, with the remedies right in, in 2007, or the remedies direct in 2007. Um, France has been there, uh, always the number one uh, publisher of these uh, award notices. I think it is possibly to do with the fact, uh, it's an issue with their, their review period, but it is interesting that they are quite ahead of, us, of all the other uh, member states. The, 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 the states have given me their top, the top 10 publishers um, of these uh, award, direct award, award notices. But it does, I think, again, indicate um, this perception um, that, uh, you know, that it, it, it bolsters the perception that the procurement rules are perceived by contracting authorities uh, not to be uh, sufficiently equipped um, to deal with crisis situations. Um, so does that mean that we need to have uh, perhaps a rethink um, about um, you know how the rules are being perceived for urgent requirements? Uh, is there or, or is it more a matter of educating contracting authorities mm -hmm. uh, to understand that there are tools uh, within the procurement rules um, in terms of dealing with these situations? And I think probably uh, the point is the latter that it is really about educating uh, public purchasers that there are sufficient rules. If they think ahead, they can actually use uh, the procedures that have been given to them by the European Union 